everyone, this is Tasa Brown, the Civil Culture Performance Assessment Specialist with the Forest Science Planning and Practices Branch. In this video, I'll be discussing Swiss needle cast, a fungus that affects Douglas fir. This presentation is specific to coastal BC. I'll be providing a short overview of the disease. I'll explain why additional Swiss needle cast data is necessary. I'll then outline the new data collection procedures. To wrap up, I'll explain how to submit your Swiss needle cast data. With this presentation, I'm trying to increase awareness of the threat of Swiss needle cast and the need for greater monitoring. I hope you agree and will participate in collecting additional data using the procedure described in this video. So to begin, what is Swiss needle cast? Well, it's an epiphytic fungus, which means it's a fungus that grows on Douglas fir, but it's not typically detrimental. That's been changing in recent years, and I'll get into that in a few slides. The fungus produces pseudothesia, more simply known as fruiting bodies. You can see them here on the underside of the Douglas fir's needles. It's the black dots. So these fruiting bodies can plug the stomata of Douglas fir. The stomata are microscopic pores on the needle surface that facilitate gas exchange with the atmosphere. If they get plugged, the needles can't take in carbon. So when you have 25 to 50% of the stomata blocked, the needles are basically starved of carbon. The needles then turn yellow and prematurely shed. If you've seen some severely affected trees, they might have had only one or two years of needles in their outer crown. So if you want to learn more about the biology of Swiss needle cast, you can find lots of great information online through the Swiss needle cast cooperative. Also, David Brush, our pathologist, will be posting a presentation soon. So, why care? Well, a tree's crown is basically its engine. When you start getting three and a half years or fewer of needle retention, there are growth losses. You can see that clearly in this graph. There are reductions in both diameter and height. Not surprisingly, this can lead to longer rotation ages, reductions in harvest levels, and shifts in species. For example, maybe the natural hemlock can outcompete the planted Douglas fir if it's been impacted by Swiss needle cast. All of these impacts can lead to economic losses. This has been observed in Oregon. Swiss needle cast started to become a serious problem during the early 1990s in their fog belt and now affects 240,000 hectares. Their average growth losses are 20 to 55% causing approximately 128 million US dollars per year in economic losses. In British Columbia, it's become an increasing problem over the past decade related to changing weather patterns. We've seen increased incidence and damage. With 2.7 million hectares of coastal Douglas fir, it poses a real threat to the future growth of our coastal forests. So far, we've seen greatest growth losses in areas with high rainfall, like southwestern Vancouver Island, Chilliwack, and the Sunshine Coast. But it's been highly variable and very difficult to predict. Also, these growth losses have yet to be quantified. So to address this, the province has initiated Swiss needle cast monitoring. They found that the annual overview surveys haven't been very helpful for detecting Swiss needle cast. So the Chilliwack stewardship staff have been running transects and Stefan Zeglin established 43 permanent sample plots. These plots are large and collect a significant amount of valuable data. So while that's great work, we do need to cover more area. This is critical for understanding the impacts of Swiss needle cast, the hazard, and for developing adaptive strategies. To do that, we need a cheaper and a less detailed monitoring method. And that's where you come in. To be able to collect enough data over the coast region, we're going to need your help. We've designed a new sampling procedure that's relatively simple and can be easily tacked onto your stalking or free growing plot surveys. This data will not be submitted to results and is not associated with any milestone. It can happen during any survey with Douglas fir if the ages are five or older. We don't want to be greedy and push for too much, so we're just requesting that you do this data collection when your inventory species composition is greater than 50% Douglas fir and your trees are five or older. Now to figure out if those stand conditions apply, 
you'll want to do your file review as per normal. You'll want to look at the forest cover from the last survey or from the planting uh, outcomes. You can also make this determination while you're doing your preliminary walkthrough or drive through or maybe even a UAV flyover these days. If you're still unsure if your SU is greater than 50% Douglas fir, then it probably has enough Douglas fir that it benefit from collecting this information. So there's no information, sorry, there's no issue if you collect this information and your inventory label ends up being, you know, 38%. We won't be complaining. So that's the sample population. Now we need to cover the sampling intensity. I'm asking that you collect the Swiss needle cast data at your full measure of plots. This term is explained in the Silviculture Survey Procedures Manual. It's your first plot and every fourth plot thereafter. So plots 1, 5, 9, 13, 17, etc. These are the, these are the plots where you're already doing extra data collection, like inventory heights and ages, crown closure, vegetation, etc. Now you'll also collect the Swiss needle cast data, and there's a lot of overlap with these previously mentioned attributes. In the manual, we recommend that you do at least three full measure plots per stratum. So when you have less than nine plots in a stratum, you turn one of your count plots into a full measure plot to ensure that you have enough height, age, crown closure samples. We want to make our new uh, Swiss needle cast uh, procedure as consistent with the manual as possible, so we're going to ask for the same. So the request is, at minimum, please collect three samples if your stand is greater than 50% Douglas fir in five years or older. All right, so now you're at your full measure plot. What tree do you collect the data on? You're going to pick the tallest Douglas fir tree within your 3.99 meter plot, excluding residuals. This tree will align with your sample tree for inventory height and age. We're trying to save you work, so this is intentional. And just a little FYI, uh, the wording from the survey manual for 2023 is slightly different from 2022 for inventory species number one and two, height and age. Um, I have it shown on the slide, and it will actually make the Swiss needle cast data collection procedure slightly easier. Okay, you've now selected your sample tree within your plot. In your notebook or Excel spreadsheet or in SNAP, you'll write down the plot number, the height, and age. Again, this won't be any extra work from your regular plot since it'll correspond with your inventory height and age. So you'll simply follow the 2023 survey procedures manual for both. The one extra measurement is leader growth. I know many of you do this anyways, so hopefully it won't be too much trouble. You'll measure in centimeters. All right, now for the truly extra data collection, you'll need to go to the south side of the sample tree. It has to be the south side for consistency. The south side is used in all jurisdictions in North America that collect Swiss needle cast data. Now this is where it gets slightly more complicated. You're going to need to count whorls and branch internodes. So as a quick reminder, a whorl is a group of limbs all growing from the same level on a stem. So here's an example of one whorl on a Douglas fir tree, and here's the next whorl. So the whorl happens because the terminal includes a central bud surrounded by a whorl of side buds. Each of these side buds becomes a new branch, and the center bud grows upward as the leader. When you're counting whorls, you need to be aware that sometimes we get false whorls or lamus growth. So for example, these branches here. It can also be tricky to count if the fir tree was previously damaged by elk or deer. Uh, so just do your best. So you're gonna count from the bottom of the living crown four whorls up. Then you'll select a branch from the south side of the tree from that whorl. You'll examine the main axis of the branch which is basically the center of the branch, center stem. You'll need to check if there's four internodes, which are basically four years of growth. So you always start from the outside and count inwards. So here is one, two, three, and four. So we're good. If you don't have four internodes, then you need to drop down to the next lowest whorl with four internodes. So for example, if you only have one internode, you need to drop down three whorls to be able to find a branch with four internodes. If you have two internodes, then you would have to drop down two whorls to get a branch with 
four internodes. Okay, here we have two examples. In the first example, we have a free growing age tree and we count from the bottom up. So this is the bottom of the crown. So this is one world, two worlds. This is a false world, so we don't count it. Three worlds, four. Then we have to check if there's at least four internodes. So this is one internode, two, three, four, five. It has at least four internodes. So we're gonna select a branch from this world. We could select this branch right here. So that's the end of this example. Now let's pretend like we're doing a stocking survey where we have younger trees. So once again, we start from the bottom of the crown. So this is world one, two, three, four. We count how many internodes there are. There's one, two. That's not enough. We need to have at least four internodes. So we drop down one branch and we check how many internodes. One, two, three, not enough. We drop down one more branch. We have one, two, three, four. So we can select this branch or another branch from this world on the south side of the tree. All right, so I realize that might sound confusing, but it's gonna be pretty simple once you get to the block. If your trees are less than five years old, you're not gonna have at least four internodes of growth and therefore you won't need to collect data. If your trees are eight years old or older, you're always gonna be selecting uh, the fourth whorl from the bottom. And then if your trees are five to seven, you'll be picking the highest whorl with four internodes of growth. And unless there's replants, that should be consistent throughout your entire block. All right, moving on, step four. So you needed to pick a whorl with at least four internodes because you'll be rating each of the four most recent internodes from zero to one for needle retention. One will equal 100% needle retention and zero will equal 0% needle retention or complete defoliation. Your ratings can be rough. You don't need to be counting needles like the forest health specialists, just ballpark it. So to help with these estimates, you can use the photo cheat sheets that I've posted. All right, so let's walk through an example together. So we've picked out our branch. It has four internodes, one, two, three, and four. I need to give each internode a rating. When I do my assessment, I'm only gonna be looking at this main axis. I completely ignore these side branches. And also for these photos, for some reason, some of these branches are clipped, so just ignore that. So this is year one. Year one is always gonna be the outermost internode. This is really important. So this one right here looks very healthy. It looks perfect. There's no defoliation. So I rate it a one. You can see that right here, one. So 100% needle retention. Year two is this guy. And it looks like there's maybe a few needles missing around here, but overall pretty good, probably at least 80% needle retention. So I rate it a 0.8. Now year three is looking a little sparser. It seems like at least half of the needles are missing. So ballpark it, I'm gonna call it a 0.5. And then lastly, year four right here, it's pretty heavily defoliated. I think there's probably only 20% needles remaining. So I give it a 0.2. Now this branch, it does have other internodes, but I don't need to rate them. I only need to rate the four most recent. I then add them up. And again, if you're using an Excel spreadsheet, it can just do it for you. And my overall rating for this branch is a 2.5. All right, let's do a second example. So again, year one is always the outermost internode. It looks perfectly healthy, no defoliation. I give it a one. Year two, you know what? That's looking pretty good. Um, maybe a needle or two missing around here. I want to give it a 0.9, 90% needle retention. Year three also looks quite good. Um, again, maybe only a couple needles missing. I'm going to give it a 0.8. And then fourth internode, a uh, few needles missing around here, but that's it. I'm gonna give it a 0.7. I add it all up and I end up with a 3.4 score. And again, there are other internodes, but I don't need to look at them. I only look at the four most recent. All right, so here's another example. Um, and 
in this example, you can see how damage can change year to year. So year one out here looks fantastic. 100% needle retention gets a one. Same with year two, super healthy, no defoliation, one. But then year three and four look quite sparse. So for year three, with this quantity of needles remaining, I'm gonna say about 40%, so I'm gonna give it a 0.4. And then year four, very few needles remain, probably 20% at max, I give it a 0.2. So I add that all up, even though year one and two were fantastic, it overall scores a 2.6. All right, our last example, this again just demonstrates how much things can change year to year, and that's why we want you recording it year by year so we can understand those patterns and trends. Um, so year one, uh, things look good. You're gonna find that it always looks good, so it's gonna be a one. Uh, year two, we have maybe one needle remaining. Uh, so we're going to round down and call this a zero. Uh, so massive change. And then year three, things look quite a bit better. A um, few needles missing, maybe right here. So I'm going to give that 0.8. Uh, again, don't pay attention to these side branches. And then year four, one needle remains, that's it. So we give it a zero, total it up, 1.8. So you're out in the cup walk collecting this data. Where should you record this information? Obviously, you could record it in a field notebook. However, we're gonna need this data to be submitted at the end of the field season in an Excel submission spreadsheet. I have it on the next slide. So you would need to do data entry at some point. Alternatively, you could enter it directly into the submission spreadsheet if you use the Excel app on a tablet. And this would be very efficient at the end of the field season since you'd only need to merge spreadsheets across surveyors. However, I do realize that some surveyors dislike the Excel app or don't want to bounce back and forth between apps. So as a third option, you could enter it in SNAP if you're a SNAP user. I realize that most coastal surveyors do use SNAP, so I came up with instructions on how and where to record this data within your SNAP plots. I also developed a five to 10 minute process for compiling this data across all your survey cards into the submission template format using the SNAP analysis tool and some simple Excel functions. If you're interested in this, I have a YouTube video posted entitled Swiss Needlecast Data Entry and Compilation Using SNAP. And for SNAP users, this is definitely the most efficient option. All right, so at the end of the season, uh, please email David and myself your data. To stay consistent and make the data compilation easy, I'm hoping you'll use the Excel template that I've shared. A single spreadsheet for all your openings within your operating area would be simplest. So I'll quickly explain the template. On the far left, you'll see the opening number. We need the opening number, not the block number, so that we can look it up and results. This will be important for the forest health folks since they'll likely want to link your Swiss needlecast data to spatial, forest cover, or maybe stocking standards at a later date. Next column, we have survey date. This is important given the seasonality of Swiss needlecast. This will also help the forest health specialists understand whether the year one internode is last year's growth or new flush. It can also help them make sense of the leader measurement. Then we have the SU. Again, this could be helpful if they link uh, the Swiss needle cast data to results later. We also have subzone and site series. Uh, we do forest health hazard ratings by subzone and variant, and we do stocking standards by site series, so this is important. For site series, you can list the leading site series or the full breakdown if it's mosaic, whatever is easier for you. After that, we have plot numbers then height and age. Again, this should match exactly with your inventory height and age from your regular survey. We then have leader growth, otherwise known as increment growth, since it could be a symptom of Swiss needle cast. We then have four columns, each representing an internode with needle retention ratings. So same as the previous slides, one will always equal the most recent growth or the outermost internode. And these ratings, these needle retention numbers will be used by the forest health specialist to get a better handle on how big and where Swiss needle cast is a problem. It can be difficult to assess for Swiss needle cast, 
So that's why the Forest Health team want us collecting needle retention, which is simple and non-subjective. For this data collection, you don't actually need to confirm that any of the def defoliation is caused by Swiss needle cast, so it's really easy. Also, our provincial TAS modelers, so TAS is just one of our growth needle models, will use the needle retention measurements to reduce crown foliage to simulate the growth effects of Swiss needle cast. So for example, they might see reduced leader growth, reduced or altered stem taper, et cetera. And then the last column is just a totals column. And so I summed up uh, the four internode ratings. And that's it. In conclusion, if we want to mitigate the potential negative impacts from Swiss needle casts, we need greater monitoring. We can't manage what we don't know. We need more data to understand the hazard and impact of Swiss needle casts before we can start developing adaptive strategies or revising stocking standards. So if you want that to happen, and if you care about the health of our coastal forests and our future timber supply, I hope you see the value in this extra data collection and participate. So that's it. If you have any questions, please reach out to myself or David Resch. We'd be happy to help. If you don't know David, he's our coastal pathologist. He actually replaced Stefan Zeglin about a year and a half ago. He'll be putting out his Swiss Neilcast video soon on this YouTube channel, so stay tuned. Uh, his presentation will provide a more in-depth description of Swiss Neilcast, the hazard and risk, potential impact, management, identification, etc. He's also willing to do field training on Swiss Neilcast or other forest health issues, so reach out if you want that to happen in your district. And uh, yeah, that's finally it. Uh, thank you so much for watching and for helping out with this data collection. Together, we really can make a difference. So thank you.